Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples in the garden, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to me except through, or no one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So I have to admit, Thomas is one of my favorites. We don't know a lot about Thomas. We don't know a lot about most of the disciples, frankly, except Peter, he gets to say a lot and gets to be wrong a lot. But other than Peter, we don't know a lot, but we know a couple of things about Thomas, perhaps more than many of the other disciples, because he shows up a couple of times, more than anyone else except Peter. Always in the Gospel of John, but John seems to like all this thinky question asking uh, sort of brain tricks of Christianity. For more on that, feel free to go back and watch the I am statement uh, adult forum we had for a while. But I like Thomas because he's so much more relatable than everybody else. He's so much more relatable than Peter because I'll be honest, I don't like to admit how often I'm wrong and I'm not sure I'd be quite so bold as Peter often is to question Jesus. But Thomas shows up three times. The most famous of which we get every year on the Sunday after Easter, when Thomas becomes Doubting Thomas, right? It's the one time that we have decided to feature the fact that he didn't believe that the impossible had happened, even though, frankly, nobody believed in those first moments that the impossible had happened, right? Jesus shows up behind locked doors on the day of resurrection and nobody believes it's him, which is why he breathes on them and talks to them and eats with them and all those things we know about the resurrection encounters. He does that for a reason. But we remember that Thomas <laughs> said, well, I wasn't there to get to eat with him or touch him or have him breathe on me. I, I just can't believe the impossible happened. And somehow we've now targeted Thomas as the one who doubted, even though everybody else did. And I find that relatable, right? The idea that someone just needed a little more to sort of embolden their faith in the impossible. But there's two other times that Thomas shows up. Once, as we heard today in the garden, he asks the necessary and very human question Jesus, you're rambling. You just said that we're supposed to know where you're going and that we know the way to get there, but you haven't even said where you're going. So like on, on the way out of the garden, do we turn right or left? Like, like just where are you going? Cause you haven't even said where you're going, let alone how to get there. It's a necessary question. And then the third time that he shows up sort of in backwards order is on the way to Lazarus's tomb, that Jesus is told that Lazarus is ill and says, no, no, it's fine. Let's have some more dinner. We'll spend a little longer here. Oh wait, now he's dead. So we should go back so that I can do things for your sake. And Thomas says, but Lord, the last time we were there, people tried to kill you. Are you sure you really wanna go back? An honest, fair question. And when Jesus says, yes, we have to go, Thomas says, well, then we should go with him that we might die with him. It's a profoundly bold statement of faith that the other disciples won't get to until the Last Supper, right? So we have all of that 
is it I, is it I, no, it could never be me. Oh, let me die with you, Peter says at the Last Supper. But Thomas got there long before they even entered into Jerusalem. I find Thomas to be the more relatable apostle because he is the one bold enough to ask the honest human questions. He's the one that is most relatable because he's the one that I think, if we're honest, is most like us. Boldness of faith to say, yes, Jesus, where you go, I will go. That's why we're here. That's why we're part of the church. That's why we've been baptized. That's why we've been confirmed. That's why we live this life of discipleship. And then on the way to say, wait a second, Jesus, I know I said I'd come with you, but where are we going? And then also to be honest on the way to say, this seems impossible. Is there something, anything that I can hold on to? At which times we come together again as the risen body of Christ to show among ourselves that yes, the impossible is possible. Yes, we receive in our hand again and touch with our fingers like Thomas, the very risen Christ, to assure ourselves on that way. He is a very relatable person. They say, for anyone that likes watching science fiction, most science fiction shows have the uh, A character that is the stand-in for the audience. So that in science and fantasy, where so many things that are unheard of and completely impossible happen, there's always someone who asks a question, which allows someone to explain how it's happening so that the audience can get up to speed. If you've ever watched Doctor Who, that's the purpose of the companion in Doctor Who. Doctor Who always travels with someone to ask what seems like stupid questions so that Doctor Who can explain how the impossible is happening so that the audience can fully immerse themselves in the belief. That's Thomas. That's the point of Thomas, is that he's the one that sort of steps in and says, yes, this is what it means to be a disciple. But can you put some signposts up along the way? And you're going a little too fast for me, Jesus. I've kind of lost sight. My faith is wavering. Is there something there? Oh yes, look, I can see, I can touch, I can breathe, I can taste. And I see that the impossible is happening all around me. And so I think, as I'm sure you've heard every year on the, first, on the second Sunday of Easter, it's completely unfair to call Thomas the doubting one. But I think that he stands in a long line and a long tradition of the people of God, right? Gideon does the same thing. You know, God, you're asking the impossible of me. Let me just put you to the test. And he lays out the fleece, right? That, that's the whole reason why we get the fleece story on doubting Thomas. Or on, on Thomas Sunday, because it's this whole idea of Thomas standing in a long line of testing the divine for proof. So too, we see in the reading from Ephesians, the ideas of apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers and apostles to equip the saints for ministry and for building up the body of Christ. And I think we often go there and say, oh, well, that means that the apostles and the pastors and the evangelists and the teachers have the answers to push people along the way, when rather we would put Thomas in this list by building up the body of Christ by being honest when the questions are too big, when the impossible doesn't seem possible, when Jesus is going a little too fast or took a, a turn we didn't expect to say, remind us again where you're going. And that is the line in which Thomas stood, and that is the line in which we stand. The ability to allow space for the doubts and the questions and to realize that it is not a weakening, but rather a strengthening of faith, right? The idea of sort of blind faith, untested faith, unquestioned faith is really not faith so much as following the leader. Faith are those things where you say, I have a question and I have received the answer, I don't know, and yet I am reminded and drawn in this direction. That is what faith is, and that is the very faith of Thomas, and the faith in which we too stand. So the call of Thomas through the ages 
is not simply to doubt, but to be honest and to question and to speak up and to speak out and to seek after all of those ways that God time and time again comes among us with these ways that instill, embolden, enliven, uplift, build up our own faith. Because the promise from Jesus is that you do know. You do know the way. You do know the God who has sent me. You do know what it means to be a disciple. You do know how to go. You do know the ways that I come among you. But here's a reminder. Here's a way that you can receive it again. And that's what we as the body of Christ then are called to be in answer to the questions of Thomas and the questions of so many in our midst and the questions we ourselves have is to then be the body of Christ one for another. Reminders of that very faith, that very strength, that very possible impossibility. Because that's the thing. That's precisely what the church is called to be. Both the question and the answer. The community in which both are held. You are not meant to have the answer every time. And if you did, I kind of wonder if the question was the right, or if the answer was the right answer. So too, there are times when you will have that, that, that answer, that, that, that emboldening of faith for someone else, right? It's that time when we both are sometimes the ones who hold and sometimes the ones who are held. And the witness of Thomas, particularly of this conversation that he has in the garden just moments before Jesus is arrested and will go through awful torture, fully bringing into question for all the disciples just how God is at work in the world. This conversation, this witness of Thomas is precisely that. To be one for another, the community that allows the very space into which God, the untold, unfully understood mystery to come into our midst, to embolden us with both questions and answers, that we might continue on this journey following Jesus where he calls, knowing fully the way. Not always, and not without signposts, but that we might know the way in which we walk, which is to follow Jesus in our own lives as disciples. For the witness of Thomas and for our part in following him, thanks be to God. Amen.